Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Golf Chat Show Live. Now, I hope you're all staying safe and staying sane in this time. Um, we've got today Matthew Turnock, PJ professional, who, who coaches out of Motcham Hall in Cheshire and does a lot of work with the local schools. Now, a lot of you have been asking me to get a PGA professional on, so we put him on at peak time. Um, now, one of the main things about Matt is, which is a fantastic award, and to tell you a little bit more about that now, he was coach of the year, and that's coach of the year out of all the PGA professionals, of 2018. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for inviting me on. Now, how are you? I mean, I hope you're staying uh, safe and sane at the moment. Yeah, um, doing lots and lots of jobs around the house, as lots of people will be doing the same thing. Painting jobs, clearing out the garage, uh, so much stuff that needs to go down the dump. Yeah, I, I mean, we just spoke about it off air before, how, how we've... Uh, Unfortunately, or fortunately, wherever you look at it, been doing all these jobs. Now, I want to get into Coach of the Year 2018. Talk to me about that, because that's a fantastic accolade to get. Yeah, well, it was it was a nice surprise. We just lost Matt there. Matt, can you hear me? So, guys, give us two seconds. We'll just try and get Matt back. Give us two seconds, guys. Uh, most importantly, welcome to the show. Um, obviously, today we've got Matthew Turnock, PGA professional on the show, and we're just about to talk about Coach of the Year 2018, as well as going through some serious topics right now in the golf industry. Hopefully, we can get him back, because we've got some great stories and some really important points we want to talk about today. Matt, can you hear me there? I think we've lost him, guys. We will uh, try and get him back. So guys, uh, just give us two seconds. We will be getting back uh, on the Golf Chat Show Live with Matt as soon as we can get him back. Now, like I said before, we are going to be talking about some really important topics in the golf industry at the minute because Obviously, with all industries and all lines of work, this time is putting us under so much pressure. So it's important that I think, well, we all talk about this and we'll talk about how we're going to survive, how we're going to adapt and how we're going to get used to this. But we want to start on a lighter note. We want to get into how Matt won coach of the year. I'm just going to try and I'm going to remove him from the chat. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, guys, we will get him back in. This is the problem with technology, isn't it, guys? Uh, please bear with us. Right, I've removed Matt from the chat, so fingers crossed, guys, he will be able to rejoin and join us because it's some really good stories. So I'm going to go through the questions that we're going to be asking in the Golf Chat Show Live today. We're going to be going through how will the golf industry survive? Super important point. And if you're joining the chat now, guys, just put them down below. We're just trying to get Matt, Matthew Turnock, PJ Coach of the Year 2018, back on the show. Um, also, question number two. Will golf clubs survive this? Because this is an important point I raised a couple of weeks ago when uh, I was live with Andrew Murray and the two gents, uh, Neil and Michael from Golf Monthly. We all talked about will golf clubs survive? Because golf clubs at the minute, we all know, not on a decline, but some golf clubs are struggling for members, for money, for cash flow. So at the minute, if people aren't paying their memberships, this is going to be super hard as well because it's going to put them under a lot of pressure. Question number three. Now, coming off a bad winter, um, as you know, PJ Golf Professionals in the UK, 
most of us rely on teaching outside. Some people have an indoor studio and that's a fantastic asset to have. But if you don't have those facilities, then potentially when you uh, get over the winter, um, come out the winter, especially the bad winter that we've just had, this will be a hard situation to be in. We rely on earning money throughout the whole of the summer. Question number four, do we think there'll be any restrictions when we finally get back to play golf? In my opinion, golf will probably be one of the first sports we are allowed to be back playing. We are allowed to be back actually doing to some capacity. And number five, this is an interesting point, especially for Matt and myself as PJ Golf Professionals. What what will our job be? Will it be a slightly different capacity? We're used to getting quite close to people, potentially sorting out people's grips, doing all those sorts of things. And that'll become very much, um, a very different, I think, uh, in the future. So guys, if you've just joined us, we're just trying to get Matt Futurnock, PJ Coach of the Year, back on the show. Technology guys, absolutely done us in there. Absolutely done us in. Um, I'm gonna try and get him back on the show. Fingers crossed he will be back in no time at all. So please bear with us. Uh, guys, if you've got any questions for Matthew, PJ Gold Professional, Coach of the Year, like I said, please put them down below. Just so we wait for him, we can add these to all the questions that we are asking him throughout the show. Because like I said, and I'm really being excited about this one. I know a lot of you have been wanting a PJ Gold Professional on uh, because it's, it's strange times. It's really strange times. And... It's really important times for obviously everybody um, and in terms of what's happening in the future of golf, what's happening in the future of our sports and everything like that. It's, it's worrying times, I think. So please ask as many questions as you can. Um, and also, guys, if you are brand new to the channel, don't, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I think we have Matt back on the show. Welcome back, Matt. Hello. Hello. Oh, God. <laughs> Nightmare. The internet just dropped. Sorry about that. Don't worry at all. So all right. I've just been telling everybody, um, you're PJ Coach of the Year. So let's start on a lighter note. Let's get into um, how you actually won the accolade because it's a fantastic thing you won. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it was a lot of it to do with uh, the work that I was doing with the schools over the last sort of 10, 11 years. So I've been into all the, pretty much all the schools in Macclesfield, Poynton, uh, Wilmslow, um, and delivered tri-golf to probably about two and a half thousand children Fantastic. over that time period. Um, that obviously helped to recruit juniors into the junior programme at Mottram Hall. Uh, also helped to filter juniors into other local courses like Style, because they were part of the, um, the programme as well. Yeah. And um, I was also introduced to disability coaching in 2013 when Mottram hosted the Seniors Tour. Uh, which was sponsored by PS Hander, and they brought some disability groups along that year. Um, and uh, I, following that introduction to some local disability group, continued coaching them uh, ever since. So mm -hmm. we get eight hours of coaching each year, and there's one group called the Titherington Wheelies, uh, and as it sounds, they're all in wheelchairs. So, you know, that was great to sort of uh, introduce golf to them as an activity, um, and a lot of people have learning difficulties or uh, some have physical disabilities as well. And then a couple of years ago, I also got introduced to coaching with the Northwest Stroke Association. So people do golf as part of their rehabilitation after having a stroke so you know that's something that I really enjoy doing um I get out of it as much as they do it's great to see them enjoying themselves and uh gives them a lot of confidence and helps with you know just their general well-being because I remember you actually going um down to the award um I was at much at the time and you were like oh no I, I won't win it I won't get it I'm just looking forward to going and then and you come back and you've won it so what was it yeah. like up on stage was it Dan Walker that presented it to you yes it was yeah. um yeah I honestly I'd looked at the other candidates and what they'd done and some of the things were fantastic uh, Anders Mankert who's down in Leicestershire he's actually uh reopened uh Oadby Golf Club as it was uh, I think it's called the Gallops now and he's done fantastic with uh so much stuff he's done with disability golf. I think he got someone to the world number two blind golfer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was looking at some of his accolades thinking, 
oh, this guy's going to win, you know, and he'd won so many other awards prior to that. Uh, and I honestly uh, didn't write a thing down to say because I didn't think I'd won. <laughs> so uh, the the announced, um, Dan Walker announced me as, as the winner. I was just totally in shock. So I went up there. Um, I think Dan asked me about four questions in one sentence. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "Oh yeah, it's so I've uh, you know I've asked you too much in one go there." And then he sort of asked me, you know, one or two uh, questions one at a time. Then, but yeah, I, I was totally shocked. I didn't didn't think I was going to win, so it was a shock when I did, and a very pleasant one. Definitely, I mean that's fantastic work by you and getting people into golf that necessarily either being young and wouldn't, have, wouldn't be able to, or people with disabilities or had an illness. It's fantastic. I've um, got a question for you, Matt, before we get into what I've sent you over and the talking points that we just spoke about before, guys. Um, so this comes from Matthew Bennett. Um, apart from your recent award, um, what's been your proudest moment as a PGA golf coach? Um, well, I think as well as, as well as the award, I think just the proudest moment will also be uh, sort of speaking to some of the helpers uh, with these disability groups. And there's one particular chat and just at the end of this particular session, we'd, we'd had a little chipping comp and, and he'd won it, this, this lad. And I just jokingly said, oh, come on, give us a speech, give us a winner speech. And he came out with a, a few sentences. And um, as we walked back, um, his carer came up to me and said, I cannot believe he's just done that and talked in front of the rest of the group. And he said, he never does that. He's never, or he, he's never hardly done that in the past. So yeah. he said, that was brilliant, you know, that he actually stood up and made a little speech. So that, that was a, quite a proud moment, knowing that, you know, that had brought him out of his shell. That's that's fantastic. That, that to me, that's stories like that are better than say someone getting down to single figures from a high handicap because that's that actually almost could change someone's life or does change someone's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think through what what I'd been told, this lad had been through, which I didn't know. Yeah. Um, you know, he was very, very shy um, yeah. because of past experiences. So, yeah, that was that was a proud moment. I mean, that's just fantastic, Matt. Now, I want to get into these questions that um, the audience have put to us. Number one, I want to talk about um, on our list is, will golf clubs survive off the back of this? So I, we all know that, well, it's not, not golf that's on a decline, but there is a decline in taking up golf memberships. Now, it's a little bit different for us. We're at Motcham Hall. It's quite a big entity. It's, got, it's probably quite good in its terms of cash flow. But we're talking about uh, your traditional members clubs, who really rely on the members paying their subs each year in order to survive, pay staff, keep the course up, improve the course, maintain it. Will golf clubs survive this? Uh, undoubtedly, I will say there will be a number who won't. Um, this will tip them over the edge, definitely. Um, the Golf Monthly article recently was saying about how important it was for the members of private clubs to, if they can, still pay their memberships, whether it be in a lump sum traditionally in April when the season starts mm. or if they're paying a monthly fee. So to keep paying that fee if they could afford to, uh, because exactly like you said, you know, they, they heavily rely on the subscriptions of members to, to keep the place running. Uh, but I, I think there will be a number who after this will unfortunately go under. And there have been quite a few courses in the northwest just in the last six months that have closed their doors even without what's happened yeah i mean it's it's definitely a difficult time isn't it because golf clubs are looking at this now saying well we've got to maintain the golf course potentially got nobody paying well got definitely got nobody paying green fees potentially not as many people renewing their membership not many no takings behind the bar but yet we've still got to maintain a golf course to a level where after this happens and after we manage to get back out on the golf course, it's ready to go because that's when they're going to need to get the cash flow back in. And I, I yeah. definitely agree. I think some of the smaller golf clubs will unfortunately go. And then I, I, on the back of that, we've got to think of um, PJ professionals. Like uh, we're a little bit different. We just coach, don't we? We don't have a shop where we sell our own stock. So for us, I mean, it's obviously very worrying times for us, but 
it's a little bit different to somebody who's potentially got a shop and sometimes upwards of 30, 40, maybe even 50,000 pounds worth of stock. Yeah, well, a lot of those guys I do feel for because they will have had a lot of their stock arriving in sort of February, uh, ready for the spring. And, you know, eight, nine, 10 weeks later, those manufacturing companies are expecting those bills to be paid. And a lot of them will not have taken any money to to cover those bills. So I don't know how it is for those guys because uh, I'm sure the manufacturers will have to realise that they may have to wait for their money for a bit longer. But that's that's like a knock-on effect, isn't it? Because if the PGA professional can't pay them, these big manufacturers have got big bills to pay themselves, haven't they? Like, it's it's just a chain reaction. So do you see, as well as potentially golf clubs going, do you see some PGA professionals losing shops and just turning more into coaching? Um, yeah, uh, that, that could that could potentially happen. Uh, ones who are, you know, bear scraping by anyway in the first instance might have to rethink and think, well, do I really need this uh, albatross hanging around my neck? <laughs> because it is, it's a big commitment uh, for a lot of these PGA pros at a private club to, you know, invest... 40, 50,000 pounds in their shop. Um, a lot of the golf clubs are also wanting indoor swing rooms to be built and, you know, the PGA professional to invest in that as well, which, you know, is it's right. You know, they should be investing. But again, that could be another 10, 15, 20,000 pounds worth of kit that they have to then put in that studio. Um, and they'll obviously be wanting a, a return on that. So, yeah, I think for a lot of PGA pros, that they may not have the finances to do that. And it's it's coming off like our, our another question here that we got is kind of uh, blending into this one nicely. I mean, coming off a bad winter where the golf industry has really suffered. I mean, Mocha, we've been closed, which is never closed, by the way. It's probably one of the driest places in the area. Closed, I want to say, maybe upwards of 20 days this year, which is unheard of. But yeah, it's almost this is the time, especially when the weather's like this, it, it, it's the time where, okay, you recoup all that because you have a, a blinding month with lovely sunshine April. Everybody's like golf, 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 golf. And we potentially won't have that. So this puts the golf industry as a whole on the back foot even further. Yeah, definitely. It's um, it's a big sort of, uh, you know, step because with the weather the way it has been, we, we would have been rammed every day in this weather. Uh, so that's a lot of income that's been lost already and yeah I think February the greenkeeper was saying we'd had in excess of 200 millimeters of rain which he'd never experienced before um, as, as you know we have a stream that runs across the fifth fairway it goes up uh, underneath uh, at one point and that had actually uh, the drain had collapsed and the water had been forced up through the ground so you know we had a a stream running across the top of the fairway and um, because of the volume of water and then also another collapse drain on the third in front of the pond. So, you know, it's never been so wet as it was. No. And you'd be, it's probably the wettest you've known it since, since you've been there. I mean, you've, how long have you been at Motram now? Uh, since 1992. So coming into my 28th year. So I mean, yeah, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so in terms of when we get back to golf, first question, when do you think we will? When do you think it'll be possible? Um, I think maybe about June, maybe sometime around June, if we're lucky. Uh, I know at the moment the PGA and Golf England are in talks with the government about an action plan of getting back uh, to opening golf courses. So I think in In the next two or three weeks, we should be hearing something um, with regards sort of protocols and what restrictions there might be. You know, maybe only two people playing in a group, um, maybe tea times extended to 10 to 15 minutes um, and trying to make it as contactless as possible. So arrive in the car park, park your car go to the first tee you might have had to have um you know I, I think the priority would be given to members of the actual golf club rather than visitors because you've got to look after your members yeah. if they paid a subscription they don't, don't want to ring up and say i want to book a tea time and 
they say, oh no, we've got um, you know visitors in who, who are paying a green fee. I think that would go down very badly. Yeah. You know, um, I think they've got to look after the members, let the members back on the golf course first, and then um, you know if they're going up to the tee, you might have a starter there. Uh, you know, in the starters hut again, they can just collect the cards themselves and uh, off they go. And when they finish, straight back in the car and off. And off they go, you know, so the least amount of contact as possible. If uh, we do get back to doing members comps, um, one of the things would be that when they have finished their round, they, they just take a picture of their scorecard yeah. and then email it to, to myself as the, the competition secretary. I would input their scores manually. So that was something we were just about to do before the lockdown did happen. Uh, that was one of the things we were about to implement was uh, doing that for competitions because you saw so much even even before lockdown was announced and golf courses were, were said to shut there's so many golf courses doing the things that which will probably be the ones that will be in place when we get back i.e not touching the flag turning the cups upside down playing in two balls or if if people from your own household so i, I for me i mean i don't totally understand um this whole situation is much bigger than golf but I mean I saw something on the internet today uh, and it was a picture of a supermarket car park and a picture of a golf course and someone put the question yeah. uh, I mean, you've probably seen it as well Matt which yeah. is safer and that I, I was thinking well yeah the, the biggest place and most people apart from the, the the fantastic NHS staff and the people on the front line uh, the biggest place yeah. where people can get this is, is in the supermarket now for me um, in terms of mental health and all these things if you could Walk to a park. What's the difference between walking to a park and actually playing up? Yeah, yeah, it does seem mad, and uh, the yeah, it probably is safer. <laughs> there is, you are not as close to as many people on on the golf course. I know it's frustrating, maybe for people who don't play golf and who are looking at that and they're saying, "Oh my god, it's just a game of golf." You know, what are these people going on about? And yeah. um, so I think for non-golfers, it, it seems a bit pathetic that, you know, got all us wanting to go back and they're saying, oh, you know, get a life. It's only golf. But um, yeah, it, it everything in perspective and it, it is hard. It is hard. It, it is. Now, I know you mentioned uh, the PGA and England golf are in talks with the government. Where will people find this information? Will the golf clubs contact them? Because a lot of people who watch this are golf club members or members of a golf club, uh, whether it be a society or whatever, where will people find this information? Do they, will the society yeah. contact them? I think it, initially England Golf, once they have uh, finalised things, um, they are going to communicate to all the golf clubs. So, uh, as I say, I think I've got the impression it could be in the next two, three, four weeks that something is announced. So th it's all been put together, I believe, at the moment. Um, I mean, I, I fingers crossed. I, I hope we are. And this this leads me on to the next question here. Um, coaching now. Now you coach quite a lot of groups, don't you? Um, how how will this change the way we all teach? Because a lot of people potentially, well, the modern way is to have your own swing room, potentially indoor, quite a confined space sometimes as well. How how does this look? Will teaching change? Will it become a lot less hand? Obviously, a lot less hands on. But then sometimes it really requires to be hands on. Yeah, well, I think, like you saying there, I think the ones who have got golf studios, I don't think they'll be able to teach in them. I think that'll be one of the restrictions, that you probably won't be able to teach in a studio uh, for a while. And then if you are teaching outside, then, again, they'll have to be sort of designated safe areas, you know, where the people stand in one area where they're hitting the balls and the coach will have to be in another area, you know, within the social distancing guidelines and groups i mean traditionally you could have had six seven eight people in a group class and junior classes uh, but i think there may be restrictions there where it's advised that if you are doing a group class it, it's a maximum of four and again that everyone's spaced out um accordingly yeah and uh, but the thing is that what people say is oh, how do you police that how how can especially with kids it's going to be hard to do that isn't it yeah especially with the young kids they they may not 
don't understand. Um, and it could be a while before we do start doing the junior classes again at Mottram. Um, you know, we've already had to unfortunately postpone the Golf Sixes League, which was in its coming into its third year. The kids absolutely love that. A great Golf Foundation initiative that was started a few years ago. Um, all my juniors love being part of the Golf Sixes team. Uh, we then also expanded it last year. We, myself, um, Mark Pilling at Presbury, Mark Johnson at Style, we created another league on our own. Um, which was based around nine holes and the holes were a bit longer for some of the slightly older kids. And again, that went down really well. So things like that have had to be put on the back burner for this year, but hopefully they can start again in 2021. Now we, we see, we see online, don't we? Um, a lot of, a lot of coaches and I do a little bit of online coaching myself, but I, I knew mentioned it before we came online. How successful is it? Because for, for me, I, any time that I do do an online lesson, I have to, even if someone sends me a video and it's not quite the right angle, you have to make sure it's at the right angle from face on down the line. And if you've never taught that person before, without any data, it's very subjective, isn't it? So what they're telling you, is it correct? Is it the right feedback? What do you make of online lessons at the minute? Yeah, so with, with online lessons, I've, I've not um, delivered any myself. I mean, I have the Coach Now app, which is for my lessons that I have now. And I've got over 200 people on that. And that's where um, I've videoed their swings for them. Uh, so I've got the correct angles. Um, I've put all the data on from the SkyTrack when we've, we've done um, SkyTrack sessions on the launch monitor. and it's a great tool for me as a coach uh, because I can see what they've done in the past. I've got like um, a timeline of when they first came and the improvements they've made. And it's a great tool for the pupil because it's interactive. They can load their own videos and their own data if they've got access to a, a launch monitor. Um, so for me, i would be interested to see how other PGA pros who have tried to start these online coaching uh, sessions, how successful have they been? How many people have uh, taken them up? I know that Mark Pilling at Presby Golf Club has run a pilot with the Cheshire County girls, um, and that's currently ongoing. But what he's also incorporated into his is psychology and also um, uh, a lady from PhysioFit in Ugly Edge has helped him out as well with some physical exercises for them. So uh, in terms of someone sending in their videos, I think you, you can help them with general swing positions, but without physically seeing the ball flight, then it's hard because um, I think as we discussed before we came on, you know, someone might come for a lesson for the very first time and say, oh yeah, I'm, uh, I'm slicing. And then when they hit their first 10 shots, you think that's not a slide looking. So sometimes people get confused with, with what they're doing in the first place anyway. So I think that's, that's a tough one. Online coaching, it's all about having the right angles with the video, uh, knowing the person's swing in the first place. Um, and with a brand new person sending in their footage and without seeing any flight data or seeing where the ball's going, I think it's hard. Yeah. I, I have to agree. You've got to get a lot of feedback from the player and that requires quite a lot of dialogue and even maybe a, a Zoom call like this to really understand what's happening and making sure everybody's on the, on the, same, on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd say I'd, I'd be interested uh, if any other pros uh, are watching in or then they're doing any online coaching or if they've already been doing it for a while. You know, how successful is it? Yeah, yeah. I I, I guess, like you said before, for general things, it would probably help general um, kind of tips and maintenance and those sort of aspects. But probably moving it on to a certain level and a certain degree is, is hard unless you've got the correct camera, data and all the points that you mentioned. OK, Matt, fi fi final question. Um, and I didn't put this in the notes because I wanted to ask you in person. Don't worry, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing horrible. Um, Rory came out the other day and said um, the Ryder Cup is nothing without the fans. So he's basically saying that we don't want to play a Ryder Cup without any fans. Now, in my opinion, I completely agree. Do you think of the Ryder Cup, the first tee is like our version of the Super Bowl, our version of Champions League final. It's raw, cursed people throwing abuse, people chanting. 
without that, for me, I don't think we have a Ryder Cup. Now, what, what do you think? Should the Ryder Cup go ahead or not? I would say not because of what you've just mentioned there. The, the whole atmosphere would not be the same. Um, I was due to go to the Ryder Cup in 2000 at the Belfry. Um, sorry, 2001 at the Belfry. And that's when the September 11th attacks happened and they cancelled it at the last minute um, because obviously fearful of travel at that time. And it was replayed in 2002 uh, and all the tickets were valid. So we went the following year uh, and it was great. And I think if I think if you played it without crowds and without the atmosphere, it would lose something. I think they should. I know there's I know there's talk of it at the moment. I think there's various financial penalties and sponsors and things like this but I mean I think they should really look at uh, just playing it and playing it in 2021. Yeah because it's worth so much money for the European <laughs> Tour isn't it it's worth so much money. Yeah yeah that's it it's it's massive for them but I mean it's happened before they've had to cancel it in the past so it can be done. Now, another question, actually, before we finish, I just, I just actually uh, remembered I've got one more written down here for you. Now, I know your son uh, is over in America, isn't he? He's at college over there. What, what, what are they saying over there? Will he be going back to school this year? Will he be going back to play college golf? Yeah, so um, he'd just finished a tournament, I think, at the end of February, and they should have been playing about another three or four tournaments throughout March. But then the announcement came in that all college sports were were cancelled hmm. um at that stage uh, we then uh, were told that um they were going to online classes at the university uh, so that was okay uh, but then quite a few other universities fairly quickly were starting to say that after the spring break that they were not going to require the students to come back and that in effect the universities and colleges were going to close so that's when we started looking at um, getting him back on a flight and fortunately um, my, uh, well Josh and his roommate from England Sam and then another English lad who was at a college just down the road um, they were in effect on the very last Virgin Atlantic flight coming back from the States which arrived on Mother's Day so I think 21st, 22nd of March. So we're very fortunate that we were able to get him back. Otherwise, he could have been stuck out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the parents of the uh, one of his teammates very kindly said, look, if he does get stuck, he can come and stay with us. So that was a, a very generous offer of them. But fortunately, we didn't have to take them up on it. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, at this stage, is hopeful that he will be going back in August. But when he does go back, he has been told already that he would probably have to go back a bit early and be in quarantine for two weeks. Okay. That would be one of the stipulations. So, yeah, he'll be entering his third year out of four uh, when he does go back. He's done two years already. But, yeah, he loves it. And it's a great thing for his um, golf. You know, the, the competitiveness out there is fantastic. And um, he did have one of his best results in Louisiana, uh, mid-Feb. Uh, he came tied second, wow. uh, 11 under for the three rounds, which was his best result to date. So, you know, his game is coming on as a result of being out there. Shame, isn't it? He wasn't carrying on because showing some good form there would have been great for him to be, to be out there. Obviously, yeah. you know, but right now, as we had somebody else on the show the other day and we were saying that it's, it's so important, I think, when you go to the States or... Going to the States is important to progress your golf game because of just like you said there, the competitiveness of not only playing in the events, but you've got to qualify to get in the team as well. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so Josh's university, um, they have 10 on their squad, but they're only ever allowed to take five. And occasionally they might take what they call an individual player. So they can take sometimes an extra one or two, but their scores don't count. It's just more for the experience. So... Uh, yeah, they, they have to do pre-qualifying, uh, try and battle their way into that top five to, to make the team. And I think that's what they all enjoy. You know, when, when they do make the team, it's it's such a great sort of feeling that they think, right, I've earned my place. And, uh, you know, they all get kitted out with the uniforms and they're proud to wear their 
university colours um, and, you know, he's managed to get to some fantastic places over the last couple of years. Uh, they've flown them out to California and Florida, uh, Georgia. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a fantastic uh, opportunity that, that they're given. Thank you, thank you for your time today, Matt. We started the show on a really happy note. We finished it on a happy note, which is uh, which is nice. Yeah, and we didn't um, didn't get cut off halfway through that time. No. So. no, but no, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for your time, Matt. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Cheers, Alex. All the best. Thank you, you too. And thank you guys for watching the Golf Chat Show live today. If you did enjoy this content, guys, as always, please do hit the subscribe button as well as that thumbs up. We will be back tomorrow at seven pm. Thank you, and see you then.